Good sir, go along, clear the pleasure ground. We will go to the pleasure ground. Episode 139, Tipitaka, Part 75, in which I will recite Pakitia 82, probably 83 as well, maybe 84, I don't know. As usual, you know better than I do from the title of this episode. If this is your first time seeing me, do go ahead and click here. That will take you to the Tipitaka playlist. That, of course, is for the people on YouTube. And it's better to start with episode one, work your way up to, you know, uh, part 75, I should say. Episode 139, part 75 of Tipitaka, right? However, for those of you who are listening, uh, you might be listening through a podcast called Tipitaka, in which case this is episode 75 of the Tipitaka podcast. But just so you know, there's another podcast called Edward Reeves Buddhist Books Podcast on which this is episode 139. And for you folks, perhaps you already know that that means that next time will be episode 140. And you know what we do on episodes divisible by 10, at least for the past 20 episodes, um, we do a Padma Sambhava episode. So that'll be part five. You can look forward to that. It'll probably be in a few days. Our special guest today, Manjushri. So Manjushri, while present in Vajrayana, um, first makes an appearance in early Mahayana. Longtime listeners will remember when I tried to read tried and failed to read the Lotus Sutra. I will come back to that after I'm all done with these. Um, for those who aren't seeing me, I'm pointing to a lot of books representing the three baskets of early Buddhism and Theravada. And special thanks to the Lotus Sutra for motivating me to read all these so that I know what to throw in the trash in order to accept the Lotus Sutra as gospel. Never mind. Uh, but yeah, Manjushri shows up early on in the Lotus Sutra as the one to explain to Maitreya not to be confused with Maitreya. Yeah. Um, or perhaps to be confused with Maitreya. I've wondered about that. Is the guy that was the everyman eyes through which we were viewing the Lotus Sutra um, to become the, the next, the Buddha yet to come? Who knows? Um, well, anyway, so Manjushri is said to be the Bodhisattva of wisdom. He also, I believe, carved out the Kathmandu River Valley with his sword. Uh, he has, is it a flaming sword? Well, anyway, it's a sword of wisdom. My old friends from a different egregore will go, hmm, sword of wisdom, you say? Enough about that. Um, shall we get to the reading? Yes, we shall. Cheers. I'm thinking that in this one, surely we will get to a key? Unless, unless they expect people to memorize 23 rules in one key, which I doubt. So let us begin with Expiation Pakitiya 82. At one time, the Enlightened One, the Lord, was staying at Savati in the Jetta Grove in Anatta Pindika's monastery. Now, at that time, at Savati, 
Food with robe material was prepared for the order by a certain guild, saying, quote, Having offered food, we will present them with robe material. End quote. Then the group of six monks, all right, we'll let them come out. Then the group of six monks approached that guild, and having approached, they said to that guild, quote, Sirs, give these robes to these monks. End quote. Quote, Honored sirs, we will not give. Alms food with robes are already made ready by us every year for the order. End quote. Sounds like this guild knows the group of six monks. Sirs, many are the order's benefactors, many are the order's devotees. These parentheses, monks, close parentheses, are here depending on you, looking to you, but if you will not give to them, then who is there who will give to them? Sirs, give these robes to these monks. End quote. Then that guild, having been pressed by the group of six monks, giving the group of six monks as much robe material as was prepared, served the order with a meal. Those monks who knew that robe material with a meal was prepared for the order and did not know that it was given to the group of six monks spoke thus, quote, Sirs, dedicate robe material to the order, end quote. Quote, honored sirs, there is none. The masters, the group of six monks, appropriated to the masters, the group of six monks, as much robe material as was prepared. End quote. Those who were modest monks, three dots, spread it about, saying, quote, How can the group of six monks knowingly appropriate to an individual an apportioned benefit belonging to the order? End quote. Three dots. Quote, is it true, as is said, that you, monks, knowingly appropriated to an individual an apportioned benefit belonging to the order? Quote, it is true, Lord, end quote. The enlightened one, the Lord, rebuked them, saying, quote, how can you foolish men knowingly appropriate to an individual an apportioned benefit belonging to the order. It is not, foolish men, for pleasing those who are not, parentheses yet, close parentheses, pleased, three dots. And thus, monks, this rule of training should be set forth. Whatever monk should knowingly appropriate to an individual an apportioned benefit belonging to the order, there is an offense of expiation. End quote. Whatever means three dots. Monk means three dots. He knows means either he knows by himself or others tell him or parentheses someone close parentheses tells him. Belonging to the order means it comes to be given to the order, handed over to it. A benefit means the requisites of robes, alms food, lodgings, medicines for the sick, and even a lump of chownam and a toothpick and unwoven thread. Apportioned means if it has been expressly said, quote, we will make, we will make, oh, excuse me, we will give, we will make, end quote, parentheses, and, close parentheses, he appropriates it to an individual, there is an offense of expiation. If he thinks that it is apportioned when it is apportioned, parentheses, and close parentheses, appropriates it to an individual, there is an offense of expiation. If he is in doubt as to whether it is apportioned, parentheses, and close parentheses, appropriates it to an individual, there is an offense of wrongdoing. If he thinks that it is not apportioned when it is apportioned, parentheses and, close parentheses, appropriates it to an individual, there is no offense. All right. So if someone was planning to give that robe material to the order and a monk says, do please give me that robe material, and they go, uh, okay, and they give it to him. 
but he didn't know that it was supposed to be given to the order. There's no offense. He has to know, right? Expiation if he knows, wrongdoing if he's not sure, and if he just is totally clueless, no offense. If he appropriates what is apportioned to the order for another, parentheses, part of the, close parentheses, order, or for a shrine, there is an offense of wrongdoing. If he appropriates what is apportioned to a shrine for another shrine, or for the order, or for an individual, there is an offense of wrongdoing. If he appropriates what is apportioned to an individual for another individual, or for an order, or for a shrine, there is an offense of wrongdoing. If he thinks that it is apportioned when it is not apportioned, there is an offense of wrongdoing. If he is in doubt as to whether it is not apportioned, there is an offense of wrongdoing. If he thinks that it is not apportioned when it is not apportioned, those who are paying attention know what I'm about to say, there is no offense. Well done, well done. Except for you. What were you, sleeping? Just dozing off, just kind of spacing out? Just kidding. There is no offense if he himself being asked apostrophe, where do we give? End apostrophe says, apostrophe, give wherever your gift could be used or could be mended or should be for a long time or when you, for you, the mind is peaceful. End apostrophe, if he is mad, if he is the first wrongdoer, the 12th, meaning the 82nd, because the first of this group of 12 was 71. And now we get the key. So this is a key for a group of 12. All right. <clears throat> this is the key. Regarding a rule and disparagement, causing confusion, striking a blow, the palm of the hand, and unfounded, intentionally, and overhearing, and preventing, and consent, and on daba, appropriating. The eighth division, that on regarding a rule. All right. Pretty clear, right? Very similar to... Uh, a rule we've read before, but surely there must be a difference, some subtle difference that I'm just not catching right now. We'll go ahead and move along. Expiation, Pakitia, 83. At one time, the Enlightened One, the Lord, was staying at Savati in the Jetta Grove in Anatta Pindika's monastery. Then King Pasenadi of Kosala enjoined the keeper of the pleasure ground, saying, quote, Good sir, go along, clear the pleasure ground. We will go to the pleasure ground. I don't remember if I had assigned any of my small statues to be this particular king. I think I did, but I've forgotten which one, so... There he is, King Pasanadi of Kosala. He's not the one I was using before, but for now, he's the king. Appropriately, it's a chess piece king. Okay. Anyway, quote, very well, sire, end quote. And the keeper of the pleasure ground, having answered King Pasanadi of Kosala, clearing the pleasure ground, saw the Lord sitting at the foot of a certain tree. And seeing him, he approached King Pasanedi of Kosala, and having approached, he spoke thus to King Pasanedi of Kosala, quote, Sire, the pleasure ground is cleared, but the Lord is sitting there, end quote. Quote, Good sir, let him be. We will pay homage to the Lord, end quote. Then King Pasanetti of Kosala, having gone to the pleasure ground, approached the Lord. Now at that time, a certain lay follower was sitting down paying homage to the Lord. 
King Pasaniri of Kosala saw that lay follower sitting down paying homage to the Lord. Seeing him, he stood afraid. Then it occurred to King Pasaniri of Kosala, quote, This man cannot be depraved, inasmuch as he is paying homage to the Lord. End quote. It's the kind of logic that gets evangelists to vote for parentheses and close parentheses. He approached the Lord. Having approached, having greeted the Lord, he sat down at a respectful distance. Then that lay follower, out of respect for the Lord, neither greeted nor stood up for King Pasanetti of Kosala. Then King Pasanetti of Kosala became displeased, saying, quote, How can this man, when I come, neither greet, parentheses, me, close parentheses, nor stand up? End quote. Then the Lord, knowing that King Pasanetti of Kosala was displeased, spoke thus to King Pasanetti of Kosala. Quote, Sire, this lay follower is very learned. He is one to whom the tradition has been handed down. He is devoid of passion in respect of sense pleasures. End quote. Then it occurred to King Pasanetti of Kosala, quote, This lay follower cannot be inferior, for the Lord speaks praise of him. End quote. And he said to this lay follower, quote, You may stay, lay follower. What will be of use? End quote. Quote, Very well, sire. End quote. Then the Lord, three dots, delighted King Pasanetti of Kosala with talk on Dhamma. Then King Pasanetti of Kosala, having been, three dots, delighted, by the Lord with talk on Dhamma, rising up from his seat, having greeted the Lord, departed keeping his right side towards him. Now at that time, King Pasanetti of Kosala came to be on the upper story of the palace. Then King Pasanetti of Kosala saw this lay follower going along the road, a sunshade in his hand. Seeing him, Having had him summoned, he spoke thus, quote, They say that you, lay follower, are very learned, one to whom the tradition has been handed down. It would be well, lay follower, that you should teach Dhamma in our women's apartments. End quote. Quote, Sire, what I know is owing to the masters, only the masters shall teach Dhamma in the women's apartments of the king. End quote. Please don't let it be Udayan. Oh my God. Then King Pasanetti of Kosala thinking, quote, What the lay follower says is true. End quote. Approached the Lord. Having approached, having greeted the Lord, he sat down at a respectful distance. As he was sitting down at a respectful distance, King Pasanetti of Kosala spoke thus to the Lord, quote, It were well, Lord, if the Lord were to enjoin one monk who should teach Dhamma in our women's apartments. End quote. Then the Lord, three dots, delighted King Pasanetti of Kosala with talk on Dhamma. Three dots. He departed, keeping his right side towards him. Then the Lord addressed the venerable Ananda, saying, quote, Well now, Ananda, do teach Dhamma in the king's women's apartments. End quote. Oh, thank goodness, it's Ananda. All right. Quote, Very well, Lord. End quote. And the venerable Ananda, having answered the Lord, having gone in from time to time, spoke Dhamma in the king's women's apartments. Then the venerable Ananda, dressing in the morning, taking his bowl and robe, approached the dwelling of King Pasanetti of Kosala. Now at that time, King Pasanetti of Kosala was in bed with Queen Malika. I do remember this was... Queen Malika. So, 
They are in bed currently, laying down. Stop rolling around, just be in bed. Okay. Queen Malika saw the venerable Ananda approaching from afar, uh, from afar, and seeing him, she got up hastily. Just like that. Her garments, burnished cloth of gold, slipped down. Then the venerable Ananda, having turned back again from there, having gone to the monastery, told this matter to the monks. Those who were modest monks, three dots, spread it about, saying, quote, How can the venerable Ananda, not announced beforehand, enter the king's women's apartments? End quote. Three dots. Is it true, as is said, that you, Ananda, not announced beforehand, entered the king's women's apartments? End quote. Quote, it is true, Lord. End quote. The Enlightened One, the Lord, rebuked him, saying, quote, How can you, Ananda, not announced beforehand, enter the king's women's apartments. He's calling him Ananda instead of foolish man. That's nice. It is not Ananda for pleasing those who are not, parentheses, yet, close parentheses, pleased. Three dots, end quote. And having rebuked him, having given reasoned talk, he addressed the monks, saying, quote, monks, there are these ten dangers of entering a king's women's quarters. What are the ten? Here, monks, the king is seated together with the chief consort. A monk enters there. Either the chief consort, having seen the monk, smiles, or the monk, having seen the chief consort, smiles. Then it will occur to the king. Quote within quotes, surely it is done by these, or they will do it. End quote within quotes. Is this one of those things that Miss Horner has decided to be polite about, that we're going to get more details about what he's actually saying in the appendix? I hope so. All right. This, monks, is the first danger of entering a king's women's quarters. And again, monks, a king is very busy with much to be done. Having gone to a certain woman, he does not remember. She, on account of this, conceives, parentheses, a child, and parentheses. I think we would have been able to figure that one out without the parentheses, Miss Horner. Then it occurs to the king, quote within quotes, no one enters here except one who has gone forth. Now can this be the deed of one who has gone forth? End quote within quotes. This, monks, is the second danger of entering a king's women's quarters. Kings are very busy. They forget which of their women they might potentially be conceiving a child with. And the only other person besides the king that goes in there is a monk. So, yeah, okay. It's a different time before 1963, you know. And again, monks... Some jewel disappears in a king's women's quarters. Then it occurs to the king, quote within quotes, No one else enters here except one who has gone forth. Now can this be the deed of one who has gone forth? And quote within quotes, this, monks, is the third danger. Three dots. Um, in these particular three dots are the words of entering a king's women's quarters. I'll try to remember that and fill in the three dots. That's awful silly. And again, monks, the secret plans within a king's women's quarters by being divulged abroad are spoiled. Then it occurs to the king, quote within quotes, no one else enters here except one who has gone forth. Now can this be the deed of one who has gone forth? End quote within quotes. This, monks, is the fourth danger of entering a king's women's quarters. And again, monks, 
A king establishes in a high place one having a lowly position. It occurs to those to whom this is unpleasing, quote, then quotes, the king is associating with one who has gone forth. Now can this be the deed of one who has gone forth? End quote, then quotes. This monks is the sixth danger of entering a of entering a king's women's quarters. And again, monks, a king establishes in a lowly place one having a high position. It occurs to those three dots to whom this is unpleasing is what goes in those three dots. Oh no, there's more. The quote then quotes, the king is associating with one who has gone forth. Now can this be the deed of one who has gone forth? End quote. This, monks, is the seventh danger of entering a king's women's quarters. And again, monks, the king sends out the army at the wrong time. It occurs to those three dots who are displeased that he's talking with a monk and all this. <clears throat> this monk says the eighth danger, three dots, of entering a king's women's quarters. And again, monks, a king, having sent out the army at the right time, makes it turn back from the high road. It occurs to those three dots, this monk says the ninth, ninth danger, three dots. And again, monks, when a king's women's quarters are crowded with elephants, what is the king doing in there? Keep that on the pleasure grounds, not inside the quarters. Anyway, crowded with horses, horses, crowded with chariots inside the grounds, inside the uh, the women's quarters. I mean, maybe they're not like apartments. Maybe there's like a, a section of the kingdom with an outdoor area that has elephants and horses and chariots. Could happen. There are forms, sounds, scents, tastes tangible objects for causing delight, which are not suitable for one who has gone forth. Do tell. This, monks, is the tenth danger of entering a king's women's quarters. Monks, these are the ten dangers of entering a king's women's quarters. End quote. Thus the Lord, in many a figure, having rebuked the venerable Ananda, on his difficulty in maintaining himself, three dots. I didn't really do much. He smiled at one of the consorts. I guess that's, you don't want to do that with a king's kind. You just avert your eyes. And... <laughs> Quote, three dots. And thus, monks, this rule of training should be set forth. Whatever monk not announced beforehand should cross the threshold of an anointed king of noble class from which the king has not departed, from which the queen has not withdrawn, there is an offense of expiation. So the rule ends up being about entering the king's quarters, the king's like personal area, not specifically about the women's quarters. But it was a fun story um, that led to that rule being established. All right. Whatever means three dots. Monk means... Three dots. Noble class means of pure birth on both the mother's side and the father's side back through seven generations. Not open to criticism. Unblemished in point of birth. You guys watching House of the Dragon? So it's not like the strong boys growing up and taking the throne. You know what I mean? Anointed means he becomes anointed in accordance with the consecration of a noble from which the king has not departed means, so not just like a random guy who like calls himself a king, right? Okay. The king has, from which the king has not departed means the king has not departed from the sleeping room. From which the queen has not withdrawn means the chief consort has not departed from the sleeping room or neither has departed. Not announced beforehand means without having announced oneself beforehand. Hey, I'm coming in there. Everybody, put your clothes on. Yeah. All right. Like, like that. 
Threshold means it is called the threshold of the sleeping room. Sleeping room means there wherever the king's bed is made ready, even if it is only surrounded by a screen wall. Should cross the threshold means if he makes the first foot cross the threshold, there is an offense of wrongdoing. If he makes the second foot cross, there is an offense of expiation. If he thinks that he is not announced when he is not announced, parentheses and close parentheses, crosses the threshold, there is an offense of expiation. If he is in doubt as to whether he is not announced, three dots, if he thinks that he is announced when he is not announced, three dots, offense of expiation. If he thinks that he is not announced when he is announced, there is an offense of wrongdoing. If he is in doubt as to whether he is announced, there is an offense of wrongdoing. If he thinks that he is announced when he is announced, there is no offense. There is no offense if he is announced. If he is not of noble class, meaning the king, I presume, not the monk. If he is not anointed in accordance with the consecration of a noble. If the king has departed from the sleeping room. If the chief consort has departed from the sleeping room. Or if both have departed. If it is not in the sleeping room. If he is mad, if he is the first wrongdoer. The first, meaning the 83rd. So this is about the king's sleeping room. So threshold means the threshold to the sleeping room. All right. Well, that was fun. Hopefully the, uh, the next ones will be fun as well. I mean, I've pointed out in the past um, the pre-1963 like gender roles. Um, that are perpetuated in these scriptures. However, the reason why it didn't bug me to the point where I felt I needed to like stop reading and talk about it was because it was the king and just the society that they were in, not the Buddha himself, right? So in, in uh, previous episodes, you've heard me complain when the Buddha himself says that a nun should never like contradict or reprimand a monk, even if she's been a nun for a hundred years and he became a monk this very day. And all monks are free to reprimand any nuns that they want to. I got upset about that. Not upset like angry, like hurt. Like, oh man, I really thought the Buddha was enlightened. I th and I thought that that meant what I thought it meant. But he was 6th century BC enlightened. Um, and a lot of a lot of these rules seem to have to do with like upholding the standing of the order in the community that they're in. And in that community, people judge if they see a nun and a monk walking on the high road together. So Lord Buddha made a rule that monks and nuns can't walk on the high road together unless it's dangerous. Um, which if people were fine with that, if people were like, oh, that's nice. They must be talking about philosophy. Perhaps they're in a relationship. That's normal for monks. If that was what people in the society thought, that probably would have been the rule, or that there never would have been a rule about walking a monk and a nun together on the high road or whatever. Um, but in those days, if you were a monk, you were celibate. And if you're celibate, you don't get tempted. You don't go near temptation. So a monk sitting with a woman alone, big no-no, you know, things like that. Uh, but this was about the king having multiple wives, and so that's an issue, but it's not like an issue with Buddhism itself, so it's another issue, right? Does it make sense to everybody why I didn't get upset about it? Special thanks to Manjushri, to King Pasanadi, and to Queen, I forget her name, I'm sorry, Queen Malika. The, uh, the number one consort, they use that interchangeably, the, the lead consort and the queen. I guess that's how it was back then. I mean, that's how it was, I mean, as recently as like 500 years ago, at least according to the Bollywood movies about the Mughal emperors and stuff. So it's, it's probably still going on in certain places in the world today. Um, but it was just sort of taken for granted that that's how things were for kings in um, 
6th century BC. By the way, since I'm planning on doing it, if you're watching this, you've already seen little clips of little like dolls arranged in various ways on like a bed with a veil around it and, and uh, you know, palaces and stuff like that. Uh, what that was were little uh, dioramas or little, uh, you know, dolls and statues and things from the Virayatan Jain temple and museum and like order, I guess, uh, in Rajgir or Rajagaha, as it's known in ancient times. Um, Buddha, Lord Buddha and the monks often went there. Um, so, so yeah, kings depicted in those dioramas are actually meant to show kings living in 6th century BC, because this was showing the life story of Mahavir, who was counseling kings um, during that time period. So I thought it was appropriate to use uh, for a little bit of um, illustration for for this episode for the second part of this episode that was that was kind of a fun story i i felt aside from the systemic sexism um i mentioned it last time but if you're interested this is uh the 25 recitals on edward reeves buddhist books podcast of the jain sutras and i talk a bit more about um jainism and mahavir and that order in particular and uh, that that series of 25 episodes actually starts out in Bihar. Um, we went to Bodh Gaya and then Rajgir, went to Nawanda and, uh, and visited some Jain things. And then we went to visit my father-in-law at his um, ranch in rural Bihar. So that's what's going on there. So thank you all for going on this ride with me. And... Um, I will go ahead and close with the usual closing prayer. To the north and to the south, to the east and to the west, to the spirits of light among us and to the spirits below, we send out our reverent love and compassion. May all beings be happy. May all beings be serene. May all beings be in peace. Until next time.